definitely feasible for Taiwan to transition to 100% clean and renewable energy for all purposes. The main barriers are social and political, not technical or economic. By educating the public about what's possible and by informing policymakers about what's possible and what's beneficial for the country of Taiwan. I'm Mark Jacobson. I'm a professor of civil and environmental engineering at Stanford University. And I develop energy plans for states and countries and cities and towns to transition these entities to 100% clean and renewable energy for all purposes. First of all, you have a lot of rooftops for solar to go on rooftops. There's a huge amount of offshore areas for offshore wind and offshore floating solar, which are now technologies that are robust and working all over the world. They're now floating turbines that you can put way far offshore so you can actually develop areas that are remote. So between the offshore and onshore resources available, and even onshore, there are, is room for onshore wind and solar. You can put them in some of the same locations. The nice thing about Taiwan is it is rich in wind and solar resource to power Taiwan 100% with clean and renewable energy for all purposes. If you electrify all energy sectors, so electrifying transportation, heating, cooling, industry, and provide that electricity with wind and water and solar, and use modern storage, such as in batteries, and concentrated solar power with storage, some pumped hydroelectric power, but also using heat and cold storage, such as heat storage in rocks, in water, cold storage in ice and in water, and using some hydrogen, and using what's called demand response, where utilities give people incentives not to use electricity at certain times of the day, then you can actually match power demand with supply with 100% intermittent wind and water and solar. So there's no need for nuclear, no need for coal, no need for gas. It can be done, and it is starting to be done around the world. The, it actually doesn't matter if something's intermittent because the goal is to match the demand for energy. We often think of baseload energy as reliable energy. And by the way, baseload energy is just, just supplies a flat supply of energy over time. But the demand for energy is variable. And so a, a flat baseload energy doesn't meet the demand, which is variable. And wind and solar are also variable. They're intermittent like this, as is the demand. So the key is how do you match the supply of wind and solar with the demand? When you electrify transportation with battery electric vehicles, you don't need to plug in a plug to the batteries because you can actually charge the batteries any time of day or night and then store the electricity in the batteries. This gives you more what are called flexible loads. It means that you don't need the electricity on demand. You don't need the electricity instantaneously. So you can charge those batteries when you have excess wind, excess solar. And first of all, when we electrify all our energy sectors, a lot of our storage will be heat storage and cold storage, and those are already very low cost. So for electricity storage, there are several relatively low cost types. Uh, for example, pumped hydroelectric is relatively low cost. Uh, concentrated solar power is relatively low cost with storage. Even if they didn't have all the other problems associated with it, it's so much more expensive today. It's four to five times more expensive per kilowatt hour than wind or large-scale solar. As a result of this and the fact that you need to continuously refine uranium to run it in a nuclear plant, nuclear actually emits about nine to 25 times more carbon than a wind farm. And so it's not clean. It's cleaner than a coal plant in terms of its emissions, but it actually results in 9 to 25 times more pollution per unit energy than a wind farm. But this is just the first of its problems. The other issue is nuclear weapons proliferation. Five countries of the world have secretly developed weapons under the guise of civilian nuclear energy programs. 
There's also meltdown risks. One and a half percent of all nuclear reactors ever built have melted down to some degree, including at least three reactors at Fukushima most recently. And then there's waste issues. What do you do with all the nuclear waste? And then there's mining issues. When you mine for uranium, that creates a lot of uh, environmental problems. First of all, there were at least 1,300 people who died just from the evacuation of, the, of Fukushima. In terms of radiation deaths, our study projected, based on modeling of the distribution of radiation, what would be the uh, anticipated number of deaths over the lifetime, over the next you know, few decades. So it wasn't immediate deaths. These are not people who died like on the spot. And ours is not inconsistent with that. Ours is anticipated deaths due to cancers over the next several de decades. In 2015, Stanford destroyed a natural gas cogeneration plant that provided about 80% of the campus's electricity and heat and replaced it with a cooling and heating system where consisting of two boilers and a chiller and an elaborate piping system throughout the university and 60 megawatts of solar photovoltaics. That eliminated 68% of the campus's electricity greenhouse gas emissions. Now the campus has just committed to purchase 70 more megawatts of solar photovoltaics to go to 100% clean renewable electricity by 2021. The first thing that people can do is in their own homes and lives uh, to electrify everything. Any other gas appliances, you replace it with an electric equivalent. So gas heaters, and air heaters and water heaters go to heat pumps. For air conditioning, go to heat pumps. For a gas stove, go to electric induction cooktop stove. Uh, you can go to LED lights, which are use much less energy than the old incandescent lights. If you have a car, your next car should be an electric car because they're very efficient and use one-fourth the energy as a gasoline or diesel car. Then the next thing you can do is support policymakers who are also supportive of clean renewable energy. The way we solve this problem is at the local level and at a national level. So we need both policies to be put in place that are strong and effective, but we also need individuals to uh, do what they can to transition.